here today. My name is Blake Kimsey. I'm the executive director of Writing Workshops. And so you probably got an email from me or found your way to the website, which is how you're here today uh, for Austin Seminar, the Freelance Business Blueprint, how to make more money as a freelance writer. So I want to introduce Austin really quick um, before I hand the reins over to him. But um, Austin L. Church is a writer and brand consultant living in Knoxville, Tennessee with his wife and three kids. Um, Austin is also a poet. He got his MA in literature with a focus in creative writing from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and has won various awards for his poetry, including a Dorothy Sargent Rosenborg uh, Poetry Prize. And Austin also runs a branding and marketing studio called Belarnum. And when he's not serving his clients, he teaches freelancers and consultants a proven framework for making more money and enjoying more freedom at the same time, which I know is why we are all here today. So thank you all for being here. Austin, thanks for making the time uh, to do this Zoom seminar. And um, we'll be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions, throw them in there. And then we can also, I guess, unmute at the end if people have questions as well. So we wanna make this as uh, helpful for you today as possible. Um, so I'll hand it over to you today, Austin. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Blake. And I'm not going to say what I said at the beginning of the last training like this I did, which is, what's up, party people? I was wearing this hat, and it has kind of a straight bill. And I said, what's up, party people? And I found out later I got insta-judged by all of the writers that were on this, uh, like a part of this training. Like, oh, no, I'm here to learn from a bro. So I'm not going to say that, but we will try to keep the energy high today because Zoom can be taxing. So let me navigate over to Keynote, and then I'll just start the screen share. Let's see. Then I think I can... Play, rehearse slideshow, then a new share. All right. Hey, Austin, before we get started, um, you're going to email out a bunch of stuff after this, right? In terms of like, you know, people can take notes, but you're also going to be just giving them some of these resources. That's right. Um, and I'll kind of, I'll talk about that. Um, but are you all able, you're able to see my whole um, screen and not just the freelance business blueprint slide, right? Give me a little feedback. Well, right now we just see the, we see the two slides next to each other, the freelance okay. business blueprint and then the United States. Okay. That's, now I need to do the advanced portion of the screen. Okay. How about that? Is that better? Yeah. We can Sweet. See. Okay. I'm not a total Luddite, which is always good news, right? But to Blake's point, and if you all see my eyes dart over, it's because there are still people coming in and I want to make sure that no one gets left out. Okay, but uh, Blake kind of said this. Um, I'm going to give you everything that I cover for free at the end. So if you want to take notes, be my guest. If you don't want to take notes and you just want to absorb it all, that's okay too. It's uh, your jam here today. But um, I'm Austin Church. I maybe do look more like a bro in that picture. I live in Knoxville, Tennessee, near the mountains. I'm really glad that you're here. Who has been on a Zoom meeting where you were like one of three people and it was awkward? Anyone? No one? Thank you from Ireland, right? Um, okay. Let's see. I'll probably not pay too much attention to the chat until the Q&A, just FYI. But... Um, to kick things off, tell me how much experience you have with freelancing in the chat. Um, I know that we're all kind of coming from a different place and I think it's really helpful for me as the uh, teacher here today to know what level of experience you have. No matter where you're coming from, 
really do think you're going to walk away today with clarity and confidence that you didn't have before. That's my commitment to you is to teach you some new stuff that you can use right away. All right. So before we get into the nitty gritty, um, I already kind of mentioned some of this stuff, put your phone on silent, write down any questions that you have. Um, I don't want to get to the Q and A and we do the thing where we just kind of look at each other and then I have to make up fake questions as though one of you asked me a question, but you really didn't ask me that question. Okay. So let's do the real question thing today. Um, all right. No one else is trying to enter. We're good. Okay. And then finally have fun. It's hard enough to be on a screen uh, on under the best of circumstances. So we're going to have some fun. I'm going to hopefully tell some dad jokes that will make you roll your eyes. Uh, another thing that I'm really good at is just terrible jokes. At the end, I'm going to give it to you all for free. So just relax. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself because I'm the bozo with the mic right now. And you're kind of like, why should I talk to this guy? Um, I feel like my ninth grade science teacher wearing this shirt. Um, so you're like, who, why should I learn from this guy? Um, I lost my job in 2009 during the great recession. I had $486 in my bank account. And I was so embarrassed by that. Like that number is seared into my memory because I thought I have two degrees in English. I know I'm smart. How did I end up in this place where I'm desperate? And um, I had never taken a single class in business or marketing. So I suddenly find myself freelancing, totally clueless, jobless, a poet, Surprise, no one was hiring poets at the moment. So I was definitely set up to succeed, right? <laughs> no, probably not. Um, but the cool thing is that I figured it out. Um, within six months, I had landed a $2,900 per month writing and marketing retainer. And you know, 11 years later, 2020, I consistently make six figures. And that has made me really passionate about teaching, particularly writers, because writers are my people, teaching writers how to get the best clients, how to make more money, and what I think is most important of all, how to enjoy your freedom. And for me, it really is, freelancing really is about the freedom rather than the money. I love this quote from Jason Fried. This is not about getting rich, though there's certainly nothing wrong with that. Instead, for me, making money is about freedom. When you owe people money, they own you, or at least they own your schedule. As long as you remain profitable, the timeline is yours to create. I'm all about profitable freelancing. And let's, speaking of terrible puns, let's put the paid back in freelancing, right? Here, here, that is really bad. If my wife were here, she'd be like, please don't ever say that again. Okay, because I own my schedule now, I spend more time with my family. We have three young kids and I wanna be the dad that's around so much that my kids want me to go away right? I also get to spend more time on my own writing. This is my first children's storybook, Grabbling. Incredible experience putting this out into the world. And this is what I want to do again and again for the rest of my life, is make books. It was incredible. So just to reiterate, money is never the point. Money represents something else for you and for me doing what you want to do with your time is the point. So the question becomes, what would an extra 5,000 or 10,000 or $50,000 a year in freelancing give you the freedom to start saying yes to? Maybe you would go on all the field trips with your kids. Maybe you would go on dates with your partner during the day. Sometimes by the time Megan and I, finally get the date night, we're just exhausted, right? We're like, we should like get lunch or something during the day. 
maybe you want to spend more of your time on your own creative and writing projects. That one comes up a lot. So with that in mind, we're going to spend the next 20 minutes going through my free freelance business blueprints. Let me admit someone real quick. Okay, going through this freelance business blueprint. And what is it? It's a step by step process that I have distilled down from the last 11 years. So many freelance writers, especially if they come from a, a liberal arts background, talk about putting in the time and gaining the experience. I want you to cheat because I'm telling you, if you start to do the work that doesn't feel like work and you make great money in the process, it feels like cheating. It's, it feels like someone's going to figure you out and be like, wait a second, that was too easy for you. That freelance writing project was too easy for you. I want you to feel like it's cheating. So my advice to you is upgrade your mindset. Many people, many freelance writers with half your talent are already making three times much as you are. And I'm going to get into that a little bit in this golden suitcase story toward the end. The lesson is counterintuitive, but this golden suitcase thing is one reason why a lot of freelancers fail to make freelancing sustainable. Like I said, I'll come back to that. Okie dokie. So if we're just to dive straight into it, you're going to see how straightforward this process is. And also you're going to realize, oh, I was missing some of these steps. The first step, super easy, list your skills. You've had education, past jobs, maybe even freelance gigs. You've picked up skills, competencies, expertise along the way. Let's take Jenny. Jenny is good at Microsoft Office cooking, basketball, blogging, email marketing, Canva which is a design software. So what I want you to do later, not right now, set a timer for 10 minutes and just brainstorm all the different skills you have. You probably wouldn't be here if writing weren't one of them, but you may have other skills that you just would never think to add to your freelance business. So make sure that you expand beyond and just say, what else might I be missing? Then you want to narrow down your list to your top three most marketable skills right now. I'm sounding really preachy. I'm going to take a step back, getting passionate, deep breath, narrow down the list to the, no. Um, what are your top three most marketable skills? You have skills that might be hard to sell. For example, Jenny, she could try out for the WNBA but that might take a long time and it might be really hard. She could offer freelance cooking services. That might take a long time, might be really hard. So top three marketable right now. She's going to settle on blogging, Instagram, and email marketing. Now there's another dimension to this. I want you to list out your interests. Why are your interests important? Well, You'll find it easier to stay motivated and do your best work if you're already interested in the subject matter, right? Doesn't mean that if you like knitting or if you love cats or if you like being a mom or for me being a dad, you can necessarily make a niche out of that. We'll get to that more in a second, but you want your natural curiosity and enthusiasm working with you, not against you. So, What's Jenny going to do? She's going to boil it down to startups and law firms. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, once you have your skills, once you have your interests, you want to see where those two overlap. And that's when you can identify, okay, which niches might be a good fit for me. And again, curiosity and enthusiasm working with me, not against me. So how do you know a good niche, right? I think it's going to have four aspects to it. The work is enjoyable. The people are enjoyable. 
you can make the projects profitable and you can get consistent projects. Consistency is key. If you pick up a client, wouldn't it be great if that same client could buy from you again and again? So once you have your four niche ideas, use these aspects to narrow down your four niches into the ones that are most promising. And when I say most promising, it really does come down to consistency. Who wants what I need, or sorry, what I offer most often, right? One mistake that freelancers make is only picking one niche. And I think then you end up sort of trapped because what happens if you pick one niche and you don't end up liking it? So I actually give a little bit of counterintuitive advice and I'm like, pick two, and then you can see which one you like more. Does that make sense? Okay, moving on. Jenny is interested in startups and law firms. She doesn't know which one she's going to enjoy more. So she's going to split test them against one another. Now, this sounds really creepy, right? But this step is super important. You set a timer for 30 minutes and you spend some time thinking through, drilling down into the prospect in a target audience, like the managing partner at a law firm. What are the goals, problems, pain points? What are their objections? Why, what keeps them up at night? What are their emotional drivers? Um, this is called an ideal customer profile. And so you're wondering, okay, what would Kenneth, who is the manager partner, managing partner in a law firm who might hire Jenny, like what would motivate him to hire Jenny, right? And oops, um, sorry. Um, well, he probably wants to grow his firm. He probably wants to make more money. He knows that they've got a decent email list, but maybe because they're never consistent, um, they're missing out on opportunities. They do a terrible job at staying in touch with past clients. So what Kenneth really wants is someone else to just handle it and do an awesome job. The key here is that once you really dig into what a target client like Kenneth wants, and why he wants it, you'll find it a whole lot easier to create messaging that is clear, strong, empathetic, but we still need to figure out what you're selling, right? And if you remember nothing else from this presentation, remember this, as a freelancer, you will make a lot more money selling your, is, are these things blocking? Sorry. Was this blocking? Okay, good. Y'all can't see that. That's awesome. Um, okay, you'll make a lot more money selling outcomes instead of skills. Most freelancers are like, hey, you can hire me for freelance writing, freelance copywriting, freelance blogging, freelance content. Sell the outcome. People don't go shopping for a hip replacement. They commit to a hip replacement surgery because they want what's on the other side. I wanna be able to get around without constant pain. I wanna be able to play with my grandkids. I wanna to go to Europe and I wanna see the world, but we've gotta fix this cranky hip first. There's a big difference between selling hip replacements and selling an incredible vacation in Europe, right? keeping up with your grandkids. Too many freelance writers go around selling hip replacements, but we call it effective copywriting or high quality blog posts or well edited social content. Meanwhile, what is the client thinking? I really wish our blog didn't suck, right? They're not saying we are really in the need for well edited social content. They're saying, no one is paying any attention to us. I don't think we're creating value. So what might Kenneth say? Kenneth is not like, hey, 
Jenny, could you send me your high quality blog content or high quality email content? Kenneth is saying, we have this huge email list that we never use. We have probably lost clients and opportunities because we don't stay in touch. Yet, at the firm, we lack the bandwidth and expertise to do it in-house. We're feeling kind of stuck. So, step number six, if, again, if we're not selling hip replacements, we need to sell the end state, then you're not selling services, you're selling outcomes. And so what you wanna do is put together three offers, three core offers. And those core offers need to revolve around that end state that your clients have been dreaming about. Now, each of the core offers is gonna have a couple type of benefits or a couple type of, I do speak English, I promise. Um, two types of benefits. The functional benefit is what they get. An emotional benefit is something your client feels. So in Jenny's case, yes, she may offer the functional benefit of well-researched and well-written blog posts. But like we talked about with Kenneth, Really, it comes down to confidence. Um, she, Jenny wants startup founders or managing partners at law firms to feel really confident when they look at the blog and there's all of this amazing thought leadership on there. She wants them to feel a surge of confidence when a startup founder goes to her investors and she's able to show the blog and say, we have this amazing content and we're using it to grow the company. So most freelancers totally forget to emphasize the emotional benefits. We, we just talk about, oh, I'm, I'm very familiar with the Chicago Manual of Style. But why does that matter to a client? Well, they want to put out really clean content, but there's even something on the other side of that. So if you're having trouble drilling down into these benefits, keep on asking yourself the question, why? Well, why might they care if I know the MLA style, AP style, Chicago Manual style? Well, because they don't want to embarrass themselves publicly, right? If they're getting all the style right, then there's less embarrassment. But emotional benefits, peace of mind, pride, confidence, clarity, satisfaction, that's just a few of them, super important to emphasize. So as you think through functional and emotional benefits, here are questions that you can answer. Like I said, I'll send you a link to the replay. So if you wanna write these down later, you're welcome to. But what's cool about doing the ideal customer profile where you think through pain points, problems, needs, objections, and then you think through functional and emotional benefits, what good can come of that? Well, you have all of the raw material you need at that point to develop really strong, empathetic messaging for each of the offers. And depending on your audience, whether you're like managing partner at a law firm or founder at a startup, the messaging is gonna be different for both, right? Because they have different motivations. So you'll have that content. And if you have two niches, well then you're gonna create, you know, personalized messaging for each offer for each audience. So what Jenny is not going to do is say, I'm a freelance writer who produces high quality content at an affordable price. She's going to say, I will help you get unstuck by walking you through a step-by-step -step process. We will capture your incredible case studies in writing and make them entertaining and powerful. And she can say, and I will make it easy for you to get your best ideas and stories down on paper, create content you're proud of, and build your brand. And she's going to say, as your ghostwriter, I will save you a ton of time and help to position you as a thought leader. You see how much better that is than I am a freelance writer who produces high quality content at an affordable price? So much better. Okay, I think we finally got to the 
There's no one else joining us. So much better, right? So, whew, we flew through that. I'm gonna exhale. Do you all see how doable this is? Like you can do this. Look at these steps. List your skills, pick your top three, list your interests, see where your interests overlap with your skills, pick your niches, get inside the minds of people in both of your niches, create your three offers, write strong messaging, and then the next one, and this is the one that makes writers a little bit nervous when talking about money. Most freelancers make two big mistakes with pricing. Um, they try to compete based on price alone and be the cheaper option. And they try to give clients a good deal. So I mentioned the golden suitcase. This is where the golden suitcase arrives on the scene. Back in May, 2009, like I said, I got laid off. I had been freelancing for two weeks and my friend Tammy connected me to this agency owner named Andrew. And I was desperate, I really needed a client. And I had my portfolio in hand. I was like sort of knees knocking. He was thumbing through my portfolio and like, I think I was probably holding my breath. Um, and then he asked me about my rates and I told him and I thought he was going to laugh at me. And he said the most remarkable thing. You only, ha oh, I thought he was going to say I needed to lower my prices, but instead he said, if I were you, I would raise your rates effective immediately. You're actually pretty good, but if you only charge $40 an hour, you won't be taken seriously in larger markets. And my mind melted. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized he was right. Um, and he made me a lot of money that day because I took his advice and I raised my rates. And sure enough, a couple months later, I landed a $30,000 contract. And then to this day, I'm convinced that they wouldn't have even taken a second look at me if I had been really affordable and given them a good deal. Pricing is branding. So whether or not it's fair, if you try to be competitive and give clients a good deal, you send the wrong signals. Low rates signal lack of experience, expertise, or confidence. Low rates say, I don't respect the value that I bring to the table. On the other hand, premium rates say, I'm good at what I do. I know how much I'm worth. You can trust my professionalism and expertise. Pricing is branding. And if you don't believe me, think about it this way. You have a choice between two watches, a Timex or a Rolex. Which one do you think is of higher quality? The Rolex, because it's more expensive. And maybe the stories they tell are better. But the fact is, whether or not that's true, they both tell time, right? They both have the same functional benefit, but whether or not it's true, people equate price with quality. So I just really wanna drive that lesson home because I coach freelancers who come to me and they're like, okay, having low rates is a strong strategic move. There's an agency down the street in my city they charge twice as much as I do and local clients, if they hire me instead of the agency, well, they'll get twice as much work for the same price. The problem is you never even get the first meeting with that client because many of your would be clients will make a snap judgment. You tell them your prices, they'll assume that because you're cheap, you're not good. So, 
Just keep that in mind when you set your prices, okay? Deal. Now, at a brass tax level, I could spend six hours talking you through pricing strategy. So when I'm getting started with, let me plug myself in real quick. When I'm getting started with um, coaching a new freelancer, I normally say, what would you feel great about making? For this amount of work, what amount of money would put a smile on your face? Now, if I'm coaching a writer in the Philippines, that number looks different than a writer in Brooklyn. You see what I mean? It, if you have a really low cost of living in your area, well, you may feel great about making, you know, 150 bucks for a blog post. Someone else would not feel great about making 1500. This is very personal stuff. So when you're thinking through your pricing, I would ask you to answer these questions. Now, obviously if you took my course and if I were to coach you one-on-one, -on -one, the advice I would give you would be a lot more tailored. We would actually assign specific prices to your core offers. Um, but if the prices that you come up with feel a little bit risky, then you know you're headed in the right direction. Pricing has to be tailored to your specific financial situation and goals. But the counterpart to that is pricing is branding. And if you offer lower prices, people may undervalue your talent. So this is the best piece of advice I can give. Charge what you would feel great about making. And then as you take on more freelance gigs, you can learn from them and you may realize that you need to adjust your prices in order to meet your earning goals. That's the way we as human beings work. There's no such thing as setting the perfect price on the front end, get the gig, do the work. How did I feel about that? And then keep going. Okay. Find your clients. Now this is a big sticking point for a lot of folks, right? Um, everything I've just said up to this point assumes that you're talking to prospective clients. Let's talk about how to find them. And when I mean how to find them, I mean marketing. Don't let that word marketing freak you out. Um, I'm going to help you create a marketing plan that's super simple. Here is my really basic definition of marketing. Marketing is spreading the word and giving people a chance to care. Your goal is not to do all the things, but to do a handful of things well. So here are 12 strategies, all of which can be effective. And again, don't do all the things. I could have listed three times as many strategies. There are that many different ways to connect with new people these days, right? You're welcome to add to this list based on what you know, but I would recommend that you pick two strategies based on your two niches. So Jenny is not going to get out there and do all the things and be blowing up the gram, right? Actually, she might blow up the gram, but she's going to target specific people. She's going to connect with startup founders on Instagram. She might find it more difficult to, connect with the managing partner at a law firm on Instagram, but she's fairly confident that lawyers hang out on LinkedIn. So your strategies involve going to where people in that niche already are and showing up there. Okay. And then here's the super simple marketing plan, regardless of which strategies make the most sense for you. You always want to tap into your existing network of family, friends, colleagues, even former employers. I would ask you, do all the people in your life who already know, like, and trust you know that you're available to hire? Do they know what it is you can do for them? 
So spreading the word and giving people a chance to care is going to look like this. You pick a strategy for each of the niches. You also are diligent about tapping into your existing network. And then you put a hundred activities into each of the three strategies. If you, you put a hundred activities into each strategy because you have to invest enough time and effort to gauge effectiveness, only then will you even know what works. Consistency trumps everything in marketing. So if Jenny commits to connecting with startup founders on Instagram, then for a hundred days, she's going to post on Instagram. She's going to find startup founders, comment on their posts, start conversations, maybe move them to the DMs. She's going to show up and be helpful. You could probably guess what happens with most freelancers. Give up too soon. You give up before tilling that particular furrow could yield anything for you. You press pause on the strategy before you've even invested like a statistically significant number of activities. I'll give you an example. This year I committed to email marketing for my freelancing and I committed for the year. I'm going to send an email a week for 12 months. See if you can guess how many months passed before anything happened. You should keep in mind that this email list is 200 people. It's not huge. It's friends and colleagues and people I go to church with. And sometimes I forget who's even on there and then they'll reply to an email. And I was like, like my dad, <laughs> my dad responds to my emails. He's like, this one was good. Thanks dad. <laughs> Winning. But it, it's been within the last six weeks that I bet I've gotten close to $20,000 worth of work. What if I had given up at three and a half months or four months? I wouldn't have seen any of that, right? And so most freelancers give up too soon. You pick your strategies, you put in your activities. If you get to the end and you look back at what has happened and nothing much has happened, fine. Yes, there's a sunk cost there, but that's when you pivot to a new strategy. A lot of freelancers internalize their failures when really it's like, it's just a learning experience. It's not about you. It's just learn. Once you've put in a statistically significant number of activities, that you can let the numbers tell you what's working and what isn't. Because if you'd asked me at four months and said, is email marketing working? Well, I would have said no. But two months later, six months in, it's like, now the numbers are telling me this is definitely working. I need to double down on this. Okay. You all just got hit with a fire hose to the face. This is like the least offensive fire hose meme I could find. Um, that is a rabbit trail you don't necessarily want to go down. Giphy.com, just saying. Um, let's do a quick recap. That's the freelance business blueprint. This is doable. And I want to highlight here some of the things that I did not mention. I did not mention spending 50 hours creating your website. If you want to be a freelancer, go get freelance clients, like spend the majority of your time on prospecting and marketing and starting conversations. When I first got into freelancing, I hated sales that made me feel like I needed to take a shower or something. I think we've all been on the receiving end of a salesperson who was just very aggressive and maybe even condescending. Um, I've got stories. We can do those in the next webinar, right? Story time with Austin. But don't think about it as sales. Think about it as this. Someone out there really needs what you do, really needs your help. But the onus is on you to go out and find them. So you start a conversation, figure out if they need one of your offers. And if they don't, that's cool. Totally get it. 
So we're going to transition in a, just a little bit to Q&A. And thank you to all of you who've already put a question in the chat so that I don't have to make up questions and embarrass myself. Um, if you do have questions, please start putting them in the chat. Um, before we switch gears, I want to tell you about something I'm really proud of. I think we have Austin on freeze. Let's see if he comes back. Let me send him a message. Well, Austin's going to log back in, but um, I can unmute you guys or you can get your questions ready um, if you have them. Does anybody have questions? I Let's see here. You can raise your hand um, within, let's see, is Austin back? Here we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, there you are. You froze. You froze right when you said there's something I'm really proud of. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to tell Megan about this later. I'm like, and so I was like, Ooh, and then crash. Okay, I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, will you enable, Blake, I think you have to enable screen sharing. Okay. For moi. I think you're the host now. This is so 2020. Okay, cool. All right, navigate back over to Keynote. Did one a while back. It was a total dumpster fire. Repeated back into my ear. I don't know if you've ever given a presentation that just bombed and you're like, oh. But anyway, um, I created this course. It's called Freelance Cake. And one of the reasons I'm so proud of it is because it takes all of like the golden suitcase insights, all the stuff that like, you know, Timex watch versus Rolex watch, all the step-by-step -step training. Um, if you like what I walked you through today, then you will love this course. I don't know about you, but no professor I have ever had taught me lessons like the golden suitcase. I had to figure out everything by trial and error. And I realized that the skills that get you into freelancing are not the same as the skills that you use to build a profitable business. They're just not the same. And I really wish that public education and even university level education did a better job at teaching us all the different ways to make a living as a writer, but it doesn't. And so that's why I'm proud of this course because I did not have something like this 11 years ago. And it won't surprise you that being a creative writer, I'm really passionate about helping my people put their energy and resources and time toward what actually works. So you can count on me for three things. One, I get some of the worst sunburns that you are ever going to see. That was a story and I'm gonna tell you the truth. It's not each writer, but it's a whole lot easier if you focus on the stuff that works. I'm also going to tell you or show you like the exact steps. 
when you think about stuff that's simple and actionable and doesn't take all day, and then you translate that into a meaningful improvement, like why don't you send this email template to follow up with a past client? That sort of thing. Um, the story about the time I lost my temper with a client while in an earth fair grocery store in Knoxville, Tennessee, and it made the relationship better. I'm so passionate. Freelancers, they trade their time for money. I don't want you to do that. It's one of the, it's a trap. It's one of the things that makes freelancing less sustainable for a lot of writers. So I want to help you avoid painting yourself into a corner like that. And one of the best parts of my life now is receiving stories back. Lauren, she sent one of the email templates that's in the vault that's included in the course to a client, paid for the course several times over, and she sent this to me unsolicited. And I come from a long line of male criers, so I got a little bit misty-eyed because I didn't have this back in 2009. Um, Kate, same deal, great writer, really smart PR consultant, was really struggling to create her offers. We did that and she's crushing it now. Jim, he was just having trouble putting all the pieces together. And he's a dad. I think it would have been hard if the course weren't audio. So he could just sort of listen to it when he's in the pickup line at school, that sort of thing. Kristen, um, hers was surprising to me. Um, maybe this is a personality thing, but she was very much into the procedures and the systems and making things scalable and bringing sanity back in because there have been days where, you know, I'm freelancing, I'm doing it. And you get to the end of the day and you're like, I got everything done except for the single most important thing I needed to do. How did that? Well, what processes help you do the freelance thing without it totally dominating the rest of your life? Again, the whole point is freedom, right? Stuart, we worked on his pricing and that was a game changer for him. Kiea, incredible. She is an attorney. So she was, um, that's what she went to school for. But working as an attorney just wasn't giving her the freedom and the lifestyle that she wanted. So she pivoted to freelance writing. And again, some of the really small tweaks can produce massive results. She sent me this email and she talked about just doubling her rate with an old client. And I've had that experience where a client gets back in touch. I try, you know, the price I quote them is a whole lot more. They don't even blink and you feel awesome, but you feel a little bit sad too because it means you've been leaving money on the table. You're like, wait, they were ready to pay cake. It shows you what actually works. Now, what is it? Um, six modules. The modules are positioning packaging, pricing, pipeline, psychology, and process. Because like when I sifted through everything I've learned and everything I've watched other successful freelancers do, it comes back to those six Ps every single time, right? You can't double your rates if you don't strengthen your positioning and demonstrate more value to your clients. So you take it in the sequential order so that by the time you arrive at, okay, pipeline, I need to go out and find new clients. Well, guess what? You've already got your language down. You know what your offers are. You know who you're going to go put those offers in front of. So getting the pieces in the right order, getting the steps in the right order, that was really important to me. 22 total lessons. Um, I tried not to 
I, I didn't do video on purpose. I think that audio is easier to do when you're just out and about. And then um, I tried to keep the video, sorry, the audio lessons fairly short, but there's homework with everyone. There's like clear action items. One of my pet peeves with a lot of the teaching out there is like, you listen, you get all psyched up, but how do you take what you've just learned and then apply it today? Like what, what do you do? There needs to be a clear bridge between the learning and the doing. And so I was very um, anal about doing that. And it's kind of funny to always assign people homework, but it's the homework that produces the results, right? But then meanwhile, when I say supporting materials, when you have a client who goes silent on you and you're like, well, are they interested or not? Should I keep following up with them or not? Use the templates I've got. They wake people up, right? When you think about, well, how do I onboard a new client? Just use my onboarding questionnaire. Like you don't need to reinvent the wheel, just steal mine, right? When you think about, okay, how do I set my rates based on my financial needs, my cost of living? I've got those spreadsheets. You plug, what I tried to do is take as many of the obstacles out as possible. And this is my best training. Um, that's it, that's the best. And um, so obviously you talk about money. You have a couple options, 449, one payment, three payments of 179. I've had people do both. It just kind of depends on where you are. We are in a very strange time right now. And I'll get to this in a second, but because we're in a very strange time right now, can you think of a more important time to formalize your freelance business and actually make it profitable. I can't. That's why I'm very thankful that my freelance business has given me agility over the last three or four months. Um, and then another thing that is probably my favorite thing in all this that I do, if you buy the course in the next 72 hours, I wanna get on the phone or on Zoom with you I want to do one-on-one -on -one consultation and figure out where you're stuck and get you moving again. And it, that is such a joy to talk to people all over the world, another one in Argentina, and then one in Australia. Australia was like morning... If you don't love it, I will give you your money back. If it doesn't make a change in your life, we are in a very weird time. If it doesn't make a change in your life, then I will give you your money back. Great. Um, I already said this. But I'll drop a link in the chat. I said, I'm going to keep good on my promise. I'm going to send you the freelance business blueprint. I'm going to, for free, I'm going to send you the six videos. And if that's all you need to take action, that's awesome. I'm like the least high, I'm the lowest pressure sales guy you'll ever meet, right? Because I don't actually like being sold to. But I would love for you to buy the course and I would love to coach you one-on-one. -on -one. With that said, let me grab the link and then I would love for you all to start hitting me up with your questions. So it looks like you have four in the chat. We've got one from uh, Betsy. Sweet. Up there. Okay. Let me drop this in. Okay, Betsy, where's Betsy's question? Okay, 
Wait, no, that's Stephanie. Did we, oh, when I left, did the chat leave too? Anyway, can you see Betsy's question? I wanna dive into yeah. that. Yeah, I'll paste it in here for you if you can see it. Thank you. All right. She if said, you have two niches, would you create three offers for each niche? Or the reason I recommend three offers is because you should always have a Rolls Royce offer, right? I don't want to get, some people are always going to buy your least expensive option. Some people will buy the one that's right in the middle. I sold a project earlier this week and it was a copywriting project and the, it was 4150. That was the lowest price. I gave him two prices. He with a higher price. If I hadn't given him that option, I would have lost out on another 2,100 bucks. First, each offer is gonna have more value, typically more stuff. Maybe you're hitting some other emotional benefits, right? Maybe you're removing frustration, maybe you're increasing efficiency. Hey, not only will I write your posts for you, I'll pick out your stock photography, I'll format, schedule, and publish your posts. I will send the link to you along with five to eight tweets that are excerpts from the blog post, right? That could be package B. Package C might just be more blog posts per month. It might be longer blog posts. It might be an extra dimension of research, right? So always, always, always give your clients more than one option when you send a proposal. It will surprise you how often people opt for the more expensive option because it better fit their needs. And if there was one thing that, um, like when I was in grad school, I was making $7,000 a year. Like I made no money. So coming out of grad school, I thought, well, everyone else shares my primary motivation of saving money. A lot of people value their time a lot more than their money. So if you, um, if you only give them the cheap option because you think their primary motivation is saving money, you're, you may be leaving money on the table. Um, so that's why I'll move on to Stephanie's question. What role can creative agencies play in the process you've described? Um, I'm going to answer the question the way I think she means it. And Stephanie, if I answer it the wrong way, just clarify in the chat. A lot of my early freelance projects came from agencies. So agencies became referral partners for me. And if you are professional, if you can meet deadlines, if you can give agencies a price that you feel good about and still leave them a little meat on the bone, meaning they can make a profit off of your project even after paying you, then agencies can be a great place to get freelance gigs. And particularly right now, because a lot of agencies have laid off writers, designers, developers that were full-time staff. And did I freeze up again? Are we good? Are we good? Okay, we're good. Um, so sometimes it's easier for an agency to hire a new freelancer than to rehire someone they just laid off, that can kind of get awkward. So if you are interested in helping agencies, make a list of 10 or 20 or 30, start with the ones in your city or in your region and just hit them up on LinkedIn and follow up on email and Twitter, show up and be helpful, and then try to get a conversation and find a project to work on together. So again, Stephanie, if I didn't hit that question right, let me know. Um, if you have two niches, would you, oh, that's, uh, that was the other question. Stephanie said, that's great. Okay. Um, there was the, uh, the, the older portfolio question. 
Okay, my portfolio, this is from Aliyah. My portfolio is older. Can I use the material now to show new clients or do I need updated content? What are your suggestions for creating new content if I'm starting from zero? I love this question. If you are a writer, you can build out your portfolio anytime you want by writing. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be a paying gig for you to include it in your portfolio. So if you have a friend who runs, who has a salon, go write a press release for her. If you have a friend who's the managing partner at a law firm, go write a couple blog posts for him or make a company up and write web content for that company, right? So you don't actually have to have a client to build out your portfolio. You can just write. Now, in terms of the older content, um, that's okay. Clients don't care. It's the same person. You're the same person, same skills. So if you were able to do that back when, it doesn't matter if it was from 10 years ago. Really doesn't. Um, now, if you go back and look at it and you see changes that you'd like to make, fine. Go back and update it. But um, you would be shocked at how rarely I've been asked for my portfolio. If I can get you on the phone and I start asking you about your needs, then it becomes about helping you solve the problem. And just asking the questions positions me as the expert, right? So yes, have that portfolio ready, but don't let any holes in your portfolio mess with your mojo or, or hurt your confidence. Um, because again, if they're like, can you show me an example of a press release? You're like, sure, go write one, send it to them. Here's an example of a press release. And this is another thing that's just true of so many writers across the board. Your sensitivity to quality and style is so much higher than most of the clients that you will work with. So in your mind, what is like, I sent, this was an accident, but I asked my assistant to write placeholder copy for a design project. Then it accidentally got sent to the client for review. And I'm like, no, right? The client said, great. Can you send me the print? And I was like, there's no way we're going to print with that. But so I did go back and correct all this stuff, but I'm just saying you, we humans do this all the time, right? We focus on our flaws and blemishes. We carry our insecurities around on our shoulders. And then meanwhile, someone else is like, our blog is dead. I wish we could get unstuck, right? Focus on the problems that you're solving for them more than you focus on your own perceived flaws. Does that help Aaliyah, wherever you are? Um, okay, if you have consistent clients, would you recommend becoming an LLC? I've had that suggestion and was curious what your experience in that area is. I had a sole proprietorship for seven years and then I got an LLC. And for me, it was just a little bit of credibility, right? I show that I'm established. I show that I've sort of got, jumped through the hoops to get an EIN. It's easier to set up business, business banking if you have an EIN. So I really can see benefits on both sides. Now, like I said, I have two, actually two single member LLCs and they're set up as pass through entities, meaning you know, all of the money just flows through to me. Um, but if you don't have a bookkeeper and you don't have a CPA and you don't have a lawyer, highly recommend all three. But um, the idea that an LLC gives you some liability protection is true. If you were ever to get sued by a client who was unhappy about something, well, then they could not come after your personal assets if they technically did business with your LLC instead of you as an individual taxpayer. Um, I hope that helps. I, I know that stuff can get super technical, but my default recommendation now is yes, register an LLC. 
It's not that hard. Do it directly with your state and directly with irs.gov. Do not go to LegalZoom or Rocket Lawyer, any of those, okay? Um, they will charge you a fee to do what you can do yourself for free directly with the state and federal government. Um, okay, any other questions? Um, okay, in terms of honing in on and finding clients, any suggestions on where to start? Like if you know your marketable skills, but they're applicable to lots of areas, or if you know your niche, but aren't sure what companies exist in that realm and are viable potential clients. Well, in terms of like, first question, like how do I find companies that are actually in a niche that I can serve? What types of companies are in that niche? Google is your friend. Then ask on Twitter and ask on Facebook. Like, hey, um, I've been thinking about helping more um, companies in agriculture. Maybe you grew up on a farm and you really get it, right? And you like want to go after ag tech companies. So a lot of this is imprecise, but just go Google and Google and Google. And eventually you'll figure out, oh, well, like, if I could serve agricultural technology companies, well, I could go to Angel List and they have a way to search ag tech startups using their search criteria. And then I could just make a list of all the ones that are still alive or better yet, all the ones that recently got funding because they will have money and may need somebody like me. Um, okay, in terms of what happens if your marketable skills are applicable to a bunch of different areas, kind of goes back to interests, right? Guys, I did a writing project for a concrete polishing company and it was awful because concrete polishing is boring. And so find companies if you can that are doing stuff that you already find interesting, right? Now, honestly, personality wise, I just love working with passionate people. Passion is infectious. So if you infect me with your passion, I'll figure out how to bring enthusiasm to your project, right? But um, if you don't have clarity around which interests could become niches, here's my advice. Say yes to everything. That does make it hard to focus in when you're trying to do your marketing and prospecting and go out and meet people. But when I first got started, it's like, if you had money and a pulse, I'm your writer. Like I will write anything you need. I haven't gotten paid to, the, to do this, but I have written obituaries I wrote band bios. I wrote everything. I've written everything except a full length screenplay at this point. And over time, I figured out, you know what? I don't really like working with narcissistic entrepreneurs. I think that's not going to be my niche. I did figure out that I loved working with tech startups because tech startups typically need a lot of content that's almost always a big part of their marketing mix and they have money. So I started looking at software as a service companies that were growing quickly, but there is that process of sometimes it takes time to figure out what your niches are, make your best guess and take action. Don't deliberate too much. Um, hopefully I've beaten that question to death. Um, Anything else before we go? Uh, we are over time. Thank you for your incredible investment. Time is your most valuable resource. Closing questions, parting thoughts. All right. I think that's it. Thank you for being with me today. From as far away as Ireland, Carrie Jade. Appreciate you all. We done, Blake? Yeah, I don't know. Does anybody have any live questions that they want to ask that we didn't get to? Or are we all good? Is everybody? Thanks for being here, Austin. Thanks. Uh... 
That was a joy. Well, okay, everybody. Well, um, thanks again. And um, we'll send out a recording of this along with the uh, freelance uh, business blueprint, which you, is an actual fill-in PDF, right? It takes you right through the process, Austin? An interactive PDF and worksheets and videos showing exactly how to go through the worksheets. So, so I'll follow up with an email. I'll link out to everything and you'll have my email. So if there's anything that needs clarification, you know how to find me. I may send back a dad joke. I'm going to close with this. This is a, a joke that my daughter told me the other day. What do you call a camel with no humps? A cow. <laughs> it's not even a joke, but she thought it was so funny. I was like, Salem, I love you, girl. <laughs> all right. Blessings all right, to you everybody. all. Have a beautiful day. See you on the other side. Bye, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. Bye.